everybody. My name is Hari Balakrishnan. I'm co-founder and CTO of Cambridge Mobile Telematics, and I'm also a professor of computer science and artificial intelligence at MIT. Today, I'm going to tell you about how to make the world's roads safer by making drivers smarter and better, and how to do that in a way that preserves user privacy. The reason we're motivated to work on this problem is that worldwide, we have 1.35 million deaths and 50 million injuries every year. To put these large numbers in perspective, what this means is that in the next two minutes, five people will have died uh, and uh, three people injured within the next two seconds on roads worldwide. And this is a problem that's affecting countries all around the world, regardless of economic status, level of education, or average age. And moreover, it's a problem that's actually becoming worse. One way in which we can assess in what way it's becoming worse is to look at pedestrian fatalities in the United States. And this is data going back about 30 years. Starting from 1990, as vehicles became safer and safer and had more and more mechanisms, you, we sort of saw this reduction in pedestrian fatalities. And then around 2009, it started going back up. The question is what happened in 2009? And these problems are actually becoming worse, as you can see. This picture here shows an overlay from, um, we've restricted it to the last 15 or so years from 2004 um, and overlaid this with data on the rise of smartphones. And it's very correlated. This rise in pedestrian fatalities and cyclist fatalities is highly correlated with the rise of smartphones. So starting from what, 2009, uh, I've shown in the bar chart on the bottom of this picture, um, the uh, number of active smartphones in use in the United States, and there's a very significant correlation. In fact, over time, these smartphones have become a part of our bodies. Um, we look at them all the time. We don't even know they're looking at them, and often are surprised. I'm personally surprised when I look at the statistics, and it tells me that I've spent four, four and a half hours every day on my screen time, and oftentimes while driving, uh, we all just pick up the phone. We don't often even realize that we're doing it. We actually call these things now weapons of mass distraction. Uh, we've collected data over the past many years from many users and understand the driving distraction phenomenon um, in, in quite granular detail. Over a third of every trip in the United States involves significant phone distraction, uh, tantamount to people essentially taking their eyes off the road for some non-trivial period of time. And over a third of those distractions happen at high driving speeds, at, at highway speeds above 50 miles an hour or 80 kilometers an hour. So this is the nature of the problem. And this is one of the main reasons why we've seen a rise in fatalities, a rise in road crashes. In fact, it's become really worse in the COVID-19 era. 2020 was the year in the United States with the highest number of road fatalities in about a decade. And unfortunately, the statistics in 2021 are painting an even grimmer picture. Just in the first six months of the year, we've seen the largest six-month increase uh, ever recorded in terms of driving fatalities. And this is something that the National Highway Transportation Safety um, um, Board recently also tweeted about, and this has become a pretty significant problem. And indeed, we see this in our data collected from millions of users. Um, what this shows is we normalize with the level of distraction, phone distraction from 2019. Uh, it's plotting the uh, number of distracted, phone distracted minutes per drive hour, and it's plotting the percentage change since the baseline of 2019. And what you see here from the declaration of the pandemic is of course mobility dropped, and now it's mostly returned, although it's returned by smearing out over time at different times of day, and average speeds have actually gone up. The amount of phone distraction has gone up by between uh, five and uh, 10 percentage points compared to what it was before. And all of this just means that it has reached the level of a, uh, a significant global problem. Uh, and you can see that in the data um, related that I showed you about um, um, traffic fatalities. So what are we doing about it? That brings us to our mission. Over the past decade, our mission has been to, world, to make the world's roads and drivers safer. And we do that by combining artificial intelligence, mobile sensing, and the Internet of Things, collecting data from mobile sensors on smartphones, which paradoxically are the technology that has led to the problem. We're using that same technology as a force for good. We're using the sensors inbuilt into our phones, things like accelerometers and gyroscopes and position and velocity sensors and magnetometers and barometers to measure how people drive. 
use signal processing and machine learning to uh, obtain a deeper understanding of what vehicle dynamics and driver behavior is like, but not stop there. We then combine it behavior, with behavioral science to provide incentives for people to become better drivers. And we do that in partnership with a number of people in the industry, insurance companies, rideshare companies, automakers, uh, city governments, uh, cellular carriers, people in the personal safety industry. So not only are we measuring, but we're also using incentives to help people become, to, measure, to, to improve people's driving behavior. And then if people were to get into a crash, use mobile sensing and artificial intelligence to help people in a crash with crash assistance. So that's really our mission. And we've really grown uh, quite rapidly uh, since the start of our company in three, in three phases. We started our company in 2010, and the first couple of years we were figuring out what to do. We'd commercialized technology out of our research group at MIT, uh, and we're really trying to figure out how to take these mobile sensing and artificial intelligence methods and apply them to real-world practical problem, and we picked road safety. From 2012 to about 2015, that was the early wave where uh, we saw some very early adopters, some large insurance companies, a small number of partners, and they were the early adopters. Between 15 and 18, 2015 and uh, 2018, those programs started to grow and other companies started to come in to understanding what telematics can do for them. Since about uh, 2018, over the last three years, we've been on a very rapid exponential growth. And today we have 80 enterprise programs. Each of these programs involves typically hundreds of thousands of users um, in 20 countries around the world, uh, several million drivers on a daily basis. Uh, and we've also shipped 21 million of these IoT tag devices. These are five centimeter by five centimeter or two inch by two inch devices that are attached to the windshield and they augment the sensors available on the phone and they use. I'll talk more about what that technology does and how we process that data and smartphone data on AWS uh, to provide users these services. And we have a number of partners in the ecosystem, auto insurers, automakers, um, ride share and mobility companies, uh, auto retail, insure tech companies that are launching novel insurance related products, wireless carriers, um, the financial industry interested in uh, ways in which uh, to offer insurance products uh, and security, personal security companies. So I now want to talk a little bit more about our platform and our products. Then I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time deep diving and telling you a lot of details about how we use AWS and its services and how we use those both for providing various functions and for achieving privacy. So let me just talk about our platform and our services. And I wanna present a layered picture of how this all fits in um, into, the, into the mobility ecosystem. Uh, there are a lot of details on the slide in the picture. Those are not important. I just want you to focus on the layers and how we see the world. The lowest layer is, has the vehicles themselves. And those are the places where data is acquired. Those are the things that are moving, the things whose safety we'd like to measure. The next layer on top of that are the layer on which our platform and products sit. And then we provide services to layers above us. Those include telematic solutions, things like usage-based insurance, where insurance is based on how you drive or how much you drive. Behavior-based insurance, which is again a, a nuance. It's a, it's a certain type of human driving behavior, not not so um, de uh, dependent on what the vehicle, uh, what types of vehicles it is, but just the human driver behavior. Family safety, especially for teen driving and 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 family um, uh, uh, safety-related products. Fleet safety, especially in the commercial space. Uh, behavioral change, which is not only about measurement but about incentives to make people better drivers. And then a bunch of crash and claim services, real-time crash assistance, real-time claims assistance, and the ability to use this data and artificial intelligence in damage assessment so you can fulfill a claim and get people back on the road quickly. We work with a variety of mobility partners. I showed you some examples on the previous slide. And at the end, we have end users that we ultimately serve. Uh, these include business users as well as consumers. And we reach our consumers typically through our mobility partners. So we're a, what you might think of as a B2B to C company. We have a consumer mindset in terms of how we build our products, but we deliver those products with an enterprise mindset to our enterprise business customers and partners. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the second layer in that picture, which is CMT's platform and products. I'm going to split that into two sub layers. The platform itself consists of data from a wide range of sources, 
phone sensors. Uh, we have a BLE tag device, which I showed you, which augments the phone sensors. So we have programs that are phone only or phone and tag uh, and wearable devices. Uh, and then we have standalone devices that we built, IoT devices. Uh, we built one uh, that's now in market uh, with rideshare and insurance, uh, commercial insurance companies called Drivescape, which is a video telematics solution, combines telematics and video data. And we work with third-party data, connected car data from OEMs, automakers, uh, as well as more traditional old school uh, third-party data, uh, OBD2 data. We take all of that data and we're able to process that at scale, uh, providing, taking raw noisy sensor data and producing uh, insights from that data using our algorithms, which are typically based on signal processing, machine learning, and statistics. So we produce clean sensor streams and video streams of data via this uh, system uh, component called trip data processing. And this turns out to be extremely compute intensive. Uh, the more someone drives, the more computing is involved. And the reason why is it's processing data coming in, signal data coming in at relatively high frequency, anywhere from 15 hertz to 100 hertz, in some cases even 400 hertz. Uh, so these are accelerometer data coming in at very high frequency, for example. And that's provided as part of the DriveWell platform, which produces various types of events, uh, episodes like phone distraction, identification of crashes, identification, identification of various types of safe or risky driving behaviors, and so on. And those feed in to our products. The products are in three parts. One product is called Risk Studio. This is about innovative development of new risk factors that identify how safely or how risky somebody's driving it is. So the question is, how do you identify what's safe driving? And how do you quantify and measure it? And we do this by not only um, taking risk factors we've already developed and combining that into scores, but inventing new risk factors and understanding the context around the driving. And a lot of that work involves um, taking our data sets and often fusing it with external data sets. The second component is Behavior Studio, the second product, and that's about improving people's driving. So the first risk study is about measurement, behavior is about improvement. It's about feedback, incentives, social gamification, and other forms of behavioral science that allow us to figure out how do I make someone a better driver? And our thesis has long been safe drivers are made, not born. And we believe, and in fact, we've shown in the field that we can actually make people safer drivers. And the third product is called Claim Studio. Claim Studio is about crash and claims. It's about helping people in need within a minute of a crash, sending roadside assistance to them. And you can imagine how taking a lot of sensory information and being able to process that to accurately determine if a true crash has happened and dispatch emergency assistance. We'd like to do all of that within about a minute of the incident. It involves a lot of processing and we'd like to minimize false positives and of course not miss any genuine crashes. And so again, this is a place where computing uh, and it's very compute intensive and computing really matters. And then we want to get in within 10 minutes to reconstruct the crash, what actually happened and start helping people with insurance claims. So claim fulfillment happens with artificial intelligence that assists human claims adjusters um, and allows for the entire claim cycle time to be reduced. And of course, through all this, we're producing a number of workflows in the form of apps and portals and messaging platforms, as well as data flows. And ultimately, these programs really power many types of programs, uh, many th these products power, power many types of programs that we offer on behalf of our mobility partners, uh, either via SDK, software development kit, and backend data integrations and workflow integrations, or via complete white label solutions on behalf of our partners um, to have both assess risk, improve driving behavior, and help in times of need. So insurance discount programs from insurance companies, um, rewards programs to make people better drivers, young driver programs, low mileage programs, family safety programs, try before you buy programs. And these have been quite successful. Uh, today's CMT, I mentioned, we work with in 80 enterprise programs in 20 countries around the world. Uh, in the U.S., for example, we have we power the telematics-based insurance programs of 21 of the top 25 U.S. insurers and nine of the top 10 U.S. insurers. So we do have that scale and that leadership position that we've been able to achieve almost completely on the strength of our products, on the strength of our technology solutions and our 
computing and artificial intelligence solutions together with a real deep collaborative mindset where we view ourselves as a partner to our uh, insurance and other business partners rather than just a mere vendor. And these results are quite good. So here's an example of a program. We actually, this is from a program uh, that we did with the city uh, government. We've done this in uh, Boston with Boston Safest Driver. We've done it in Los Angeles and Seattle and San Antonio and several other cities. And we typically find that within 30 days, we can reduce phone distraction down by 39%, at risk speeding or risky speeding down by about 30%, and uh, pronounced heartbreaking patterns by as much as 50%. And all of this improves um, crash rates. It makes these drivers safer. It makes them safer. It makes society safer, and it's a win for city governments, for society, um, and for insurance companies as well. So I want to now talk about some of the algorithms so you understand what the processing looks like. And that way, when we talk about how AWS um, helps us and how we use AWS and all of the different capabilities it offers and how we've evolved those um, our use of AWS, uh, you'll have a much better appreciation uh, of what we do. So let me talk about measuring driver behavior. How do you tell what a pattern of good driving or bad driving is? Now, one way you could do this is you could ask people. And we indeed did this several years ago. And I remember one survey we did. We asked uh, people, um, are you well above average? The idea being, are you in the top third of driving? 81% of people responded saying they're well above average. In breaking it out demographically, more men said they were well above average than women, but even women were well above average or considered themselves well above average. Now, the data showed, and by definition, well above average was the top 33%. And the idea is that most people believe they're good drivers. The interesting thing is we can actually leverage that. When we measure it, we show them how they're driving, and then we provide incentives and feedback. They actually often do become better drivers. So how do we measure good driving or bad driving behavior? Well, we collect a lot of different factors, things like phone motion, which signals distraction, or screen interaction, where we can use the accelerometer and gyroscope data on the phone to figure out uh, what's going on on the phone. We don't spy on any of the applications. We don't know any of that. All it's doing is purely based on sensor data, purely based on accelerometer and gyroscope data collected at high frequency. And we're able to use machine learning to build models to identify phone distraction. A pronounced pattern of heartbreaking for which we again use accelerometer data together with velocity data. Um, at risk speeding for which we do use um, speed data coming out of the phone together with knowledge of location. So we're able to understand what the typical speed limits are as well as typical driving speeds. What's, what, how fast do people actually drive on certain roads? Um, the types of roads really matter. Um, and we also use information about near crashes or what we call telematics collisions, which is things that are detected by the telematic system whether or not a claim might actually be filed. And we can take all these factors and start to build models with them. And these risk factors that we've built are based on millions of trips and billions of miles. And the most important thing from, a, for example, an insurance perspective that you want to understand is that all insurance pricing models for auto insurance, for example, are based on correlations. You're trying to identify a set of variables that are correlated with claims or crashes. Telematics is, for the first time in the history of the field, it allows us to measure and use factors that are causative, not merely correlated, like phone distraction or a pronounced pattern of heartbreaking that indicates a lack of anticipation or excessive speeding well above what typical speeds are. All of these are causative factors. They're not just correlated. And what that means is they're also controllable. I may not be able to, con I, I know I can't control my age or my kid's age, you know, a teen driver, has a high insurance premium because statistically such people have a lot more claims, but individually they might not. And with telematics, you can prove how good you are, but you can also improve how good you are. So these are causative and controllable. And fundamentally they allow for differentiation because nobody says everyone's equal. But what this allows us to do, what telematics allows us to do is to set and segment prices based on actual risk, based on how people are driving, differentiate without discrimination. And I think that's the power that telematics offers. And that's why um, we think this is the wave. And indeed, the market is speaking this way. Over the last three years, the growth has been exponential, uh, both in the US and abroad for these programs. 
here's some data on how predictive it is. And statisticians and actuaries measure this with something called a lift curve. So that's what's shown here. Uh, what you do is you take all the drivers that you have and you score them according to whatever algorithms you want. So you have a new idea for an algorithm, you come up with it, you, you say, all right, here's your score. Then you rank all the drivers, top 10% or 20%, the next 10%, the next 10%, and so on. And then you take each of those groups of people, each of those bins, and you ask, what was the rate at which they had crashes? Or what was the rate at which they had claims? Or what was the cost of claims associated with each of those deciles or quantiles of users? If you've built a good model, what you'll find is that the worst drivers, according to your ranking system, have a higher probability or a higher rate of crash or a higher cost of crash compared to the best. And if you have a lousy model, it's going to be flat or worse, it's going to come, you know, decrease down. But like a flat curve is not a good one. It's not differentiating. And what we find is that we measure this lift that's typically a factor of two or a factor of three. And for things like bodily injury, which is serious crashes, it could be even as high as a factor of 16. Namely, in our ranking system, the best 10% of drivers uh, compared to the worst 10% of drivers, according to our ranking, might have a 10 to one ratio of the cost of a significant claim or cost of our bodily injury. So that's what differentiation gives you with these types of model. And indeed, we don't just develop this and run it on our data. We've done the work to validate this with departments of insurance, insurance is a regulated business in, in many states in the US. And we have approvals for our telematics only scores in 48 states. And many of our insurance partners have done a lot more with it. They've combined it with traditional scoring mechanisms, with, with other proxy mechanisms that they use. Um, and they also leverage our filings to benefit in their own filings. They're able to take our filings and then combine that more readily, it's something called a Me Too filing, so they can more readily get telematics off the ground. Now, telematics is rooted in sensor data and it's computationally intensive in terms of how you process. Historically, going back 10, 15, 20 years ago, we needed expensive hardware. You needed hardware that would attach to the onboard diagnostic bus of the vehicle or a black box that's often $100 or $200. What we pioneered at CMT leading from that research out at MIT, and then through our company, we pioneered many things. We pioneered the use of smartphone sensors, the same technology that is today the dominant cause of crashes on the road, phone distraction. When you run in the background without the user's input, automatically capturing data from accelerometers and gyroscopes that measure and then process the data to measure how people drive, we can use that same technology to measure and then improve people's driving. And we didn't stop with just smartphone sensing. We've invented a slew of IoT products, name, including the tag device that I showed you before, and have shipped millions of them around the world. And we have an entire suite of products that's agnostic to the source of data. And we're able to measure both vehicle dynamics and human driver behavior. And you can see that these phones come with a plethora of sensors and every generation of smartphone, not only does it become slicker with better cameras and all of the stuff that we don't use. It also comes with a variety of great sensors and they keep improving those set of sensors. The driver tag I showed you allows us to combine tag and phone data. It has some advantages. Now we offer phone only programs, but phone and tag programs have some other advantages. For one, you can measure driving even if the phone's not present. So it has its own secure storage. It gathers its own events, inertial events. It doesn't have a GPS. It has just inertial accelerometer and inertial sensor data, but we're able to use that to record various types of risky events and to use that data with some clever machine learning to estimate vehicle mileage and vehicle speed. Uh, it's a very simple process. It's like a highway toll transponder. You, know, you get it in the mail, you s remove the little two sticky um, um, stickers at the back, and stick it to the windshield, and you're up and running. There's one button press, it automatically links to your phone and uh, via Bluetooth, and it communicates via Bluetooth opportunistically whenever, whenever the phone is present, and all the upgrades are over the air. The cool thing is there's no wires. It's cordless, and it runs for about four years on just a coin cell battery, after which you get rid of the device. We also have data sources that are connected plus. So this is with OEM data automated, uh, with, from the vehicle itself. Uh, we collect that, uh, we were able to process that data as well. And not only can we process that data to produce all of the risk factors and the behavioral improvements we talked about, we can actually combine it with phone data. So you can get phone distraction from phones and combine it with vehicular data and produce even better products with respect to risk assessment. 
And of course, you can also marry this with third-party data, things like weather and road conditions. And last but not least, I mentioned Drivescape before. This is our product that's a video telematics product that uses computer vision together with a sensor data, um, both from telematics uh, sensing data as well as a dual-facing dash cam. You can turn one of the cameras off or on. There's a variety of use cases. We've just launched a rideshare application uh, motivated to help drivers. It's called Your Ally on the Road, and it's intended for drivers to prove that they were not at fault and to be safer. But there's also a component intended in the rideshare market for passengers to prove that they're safer, and it helps a lot with dispute resolution, with uh, uh, damage assessment, with claims management, um, and uh, this is something that we're really, really excited about. It comes with a variety of AI techniques built in, um, and privacy is front and center of this product. In fact, uh, most of the data doesn't leave the edge device except under certain conditions at which point it's brought to the cloud with authorizations in place. Um, and the driver is essentially in control of what the data is and under what conditions it gets shared. So these algorithms that I talked about before, what algorithms are these? They convert these raw sensor data streams often coming in at 15 or 100 hertz to insights. So the insights we come up with are for vehicle dynamics. You have a phone that might be in somebody's pocket. People might be using the phone while driving, and it might be moving around. I want to take the accelerometer data, the three-axis acceleration data from the phone, and figure out how is the vehicle doing, and tease apart the phone distraction that the user is moving the phone. So how do you tease apart phone motion of the user on the phone from the acceleration and braking patterns and cornering patterns experienced by the vehicle. It's a very difficult problem, something that we've invested many years of work in, many patterns. And these algorithms have to run on an hour-long drive, typically within a couple of minutes, with massive amounts of sensory data. AWS helps us do that. That's not it. We do map matching from noisy sensor position data obtained from commodity phone devices, often sporadically because we're trying to save battery. How do you obtain the actual route and the path taken by the vehicle and obtain information about the speed. Phone distraction, different types of phone distraction. How do I use my tapping of the phone using just the accelerometer and gyroscope to build models that say you were tapping? Uh, understanding if you were the driver or the passenger. Were you in a bus? Were you in a train? Were you on a boat? Were you on a bicycle? Or were you driving? And if you were driving, were you the driver or the passenger? Turns out machine learning can be used to produce highly accurate data, again, you need a lot of computation for this, and you want to do this quickly. Um, estimating mileage and speed from not only GPS, but in the absence of GPS or with sporadic GPS, can you use just accelerometer inertial data to obtain mileage and speed? And again, this is a place where machine learning and signal processing come to the rescue, and this is, this is just really difficult algorithms that we're able to run. And last but not least, real-time crash detection. I talked about this before. How do you distinguish a crash from somebody dropping the phone and hitting the brakes? Basic problem, difficult problem. We're able to solve it. Not perfectly. Perfection is something we aspire toward, but we keep getting better and better. And again, it's a place where the computational infrastructure that we're able to leverage helps us in achieving these goals. Let me say a few words about crash assistance. The idea is to figure out if someone is in a crash in real time, within a few seconds, ideally within 30 seconds of a crash, or even less, within five or 10 seconds in some cases, determine if there's a crash and start dispatching roadside assistance. This is now a complicated process. Not only have to, do you have to assess whether it's a genuine crash, you have to figure out how intense or severe it is, escalate it under different conditions. If it's a fender bender versus something where the vehicle is drivable versus the vehicle is not drivable, but the people are okay versus True injury. Do you have to dispatch tow trucks or an ambulance? Do you contact the family members? All of this stuff has to be done, and we hope, we would like to be able to do this within a minute of the incident. This is a difficult problem, and that's something that uh, we've invested a lot of R&D effort in, and these products are now in market. I'll describe that. But we don't want to stop there. Once we dispatch roadside assistance, we then want to start processing data as it comes in from the sensors to produce an automated description of the crashes and dispatch it to our partners, whether they be insurance companies or anyone else who's authorized to receive this data. And all this is done through AI. We produce natural language, textual description of the event in a way that's human readable completely through AI. And we also are able to produce data reports with hundreds of fields 
to start populating the claims process. So whereas a claim intake might have taken four calls of 20 minutes on average, each lasting over an hour, we can now do that within two or three minutes, mostly by confirming what happened during the event because there is an accurate, unbiased source of truth of what happened. And that's enabled by algorithms. And all of this is based on sensor data, high frequency sensor data, accelerometer, gyroscope, etc. Now, crash assisted as a product is going mainstream. The earlier product with risk assessment is extremely mainstream with millions of users. Um, and I mentioned 21 of the top 25 US insurers. Crash assist is also going mainstream. A variety of insurance companies, uh, one, this picture here shows Signal, um, um, which is a product uh, that we built uh, for farmers insurance with crash assist. And this is now being advertised on TV. But there are consumer products as well from Verizon and ADT um, that offer family safety with crash detection and emergency or roadside assistance in some cases. So these products are now going mainstream purely based on mobile telematics, mobile sensing technology. So all of this, I hope I've convinced you that all of this requires significant processing and data infrastructure. It's about extracting insights from massive amounts of raw, noisy, sometimes corrupted sensor data. How do we do that? And this is where AWS has been a wonderful infrastructure provider for us uh, since pretty much almost day one. Um, on day zero, um, you know, we, we were using a different hosting provider, not a cloud provider. We had our own data center colo facility, but quickly dawned on us that we really needed to move into, uh, into something like a, a public cloud. Now, I have to, in our defense, our day zero was in 2010. 2012, we moved to AWS. And this actually, we dug up our first bill. Actually, our first bill, monthly bill, was for $0. This is our second monthly bill for $634.55. And somewhere in here, there's a $3.48 credit because of something, there was some issue, $600. Um, suffice it to say that we pay just a little bit more than that now, uh, given the scale that we have. Uh, but we've been um, uh, extremely pleased with AWS. And I'm gonna tell you what we do and how we do it on AWS. Our operational footprint right now uh, has moved from um, a small number of locations to uh, about nine availability zones around the world. Um, this is something that actually has some, not only performance benefits, those are actually secondary. They primarily have um, privacy benefits and compliance benefits. So data that's gathered from a country typically, typically resides within that country or within that jurisdiction like EU or the US or Canada or Australia or Japan. So here's what the telematics processing um, architecture looks like for us. And I'm gonna have this be an animation build so you can see the different components. On the left, we have partner systems. You know, they manage the users and we have a variety of B2B integrations. And one thing that's noteworthy here is that we've been on cloud, on public cloud, on AWS for pretty much about 10 years now. And um, we're pleased to note that several of our insurance partners moved for the first time to the cloud because of telematics and in some, in many cases, because of the partnership with us. And we found that it was much easier to share data and share, collaborate, um, share, um, um, compute and collaborate more readily on that common cloud infrastructure. So we have these partner systems and we have a wide range of telematics data that I have spent a lot of time talking about. And then we have contextual external sources, weather data, traffic data, map data. We have a variety of different data streams. They're extremely heterogeneous. Some of them are user clicks. Many of them are machine generated and several of them are external contextual data. And we combine all of that as that data comes in, as is typical, they get put into an operational data store. We call that hot data. And the trick is the hot data is what your um, semi real time, near real time or real time computations run on. So it's important that it be highly available highly scalable and performant. And this is where a lot of our compute runs. This compute processing that we have is, is quite intensive because I, I talked to you about some of the things we do and you can imagine how complicated those algorithms might be. These relate to detecting events, detecting crashes, uh, mapping uh, trips and scoring. 
We take those results as they come in running on the hot data set, and typically within a few seconds of processing or a, min a couple of minutes of processing when trip ends, we send information back to partner services. Things like crash assistance, the moment it hits our system, we want to get answers back within a few seconds to decide whether to dispatch into real time. And sometimes those partner systems do their own computation, they come back to us and we do it. So all of that has to run quickly. We have many, many, many stages in the, in the pipeline. Um, Certain other things are near real time. The first notice of loss is when the claims process starts getting f null. That's when the claims process starts getting kicked off. Uh, that's near real time. Driver scoring, near real time. There are risk events um, that also are near real time. What I mean by that is when a trip ends, it usually takes a couple of minutes for the phone or the mobile device to determine the trip has ended. It uploads the data, and then we start running on it. We typically have a couple of minutes to get that done. I'll talk later about the type of SLAs we support. These are statistical SLAs, and they're pretty interesting, and there's an innovative way in which we use AWS to achieve those SLAs. And then there are crash reconstruction. There are services, an example of a service that's an on-needed, as-needed basis. And then we send information back to users or drivers, crash assistance, um, scores, risks, rewards, leaderboards, family safety. All of these are user-facing rather than business-facing functions. And then the hot data, of course, once it gets larger and larger and larger, it no longer needs to be hot. It needs to be moved into data warehouses. We use a number of Amazon services on AWS as those warehouse functions. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail later about how we use, what we do and how we use it. And the key is that insights come out of that. They go back to our partner systems. They go back to our own systems. And they use to improve the service and to develop new services. So in some ways, this is a traditional life cycle. What's really unique here is that a lot of the times people run with user data. You know, there's web clicks or things that are generated by financial transactions or something like that, or e-commerce. Those are great. What's unique here is we have that kind of user-generated stuff, but we have massive amounts of sensory data. Now, lots of people do video stuff, we do too, but we have sensory data, accelerometers, gyroscopes, velocity, things like that. So these are about movement patterns, and that's really where our expertise is and how we leverage AWS to build compute infrastructure and processing and storage infrastructure, uh, compute and storage infrastructure on top of AWS. So let me now talk about each of these components. So I want to talk about the hot data. I'll first talk about the data store and what we do and what we've learned, and then I'll talk about the processing side, and then I'll talk about the warehouse. So on the data store, the operational data store is, is kind of, you know, you should think of this as drives come in, they get uploaded, and we need to run a whole bunch of signal processing and machine learning computation on it to figure out what happened on that trip and then we produce some results. The result, and then sometimes trip data comes in where the mobile device or the IoT device thinks there might have been a crash, and then it needs to be validated by the cloud. That's where more of the computers and more of the clever algorithms can run. So we've had an evolution of our hot data store. Originally when we started, uh, we used PostgreSQL, uh, and we ran it on EC2 instances, and um, we kind of used uh, EBS as the backing store for that, and we've gone through a variety of different versions of that. And we used Postgres in part because it had some geographic querying capabilities. We were very familiar with it through our prior work. Um, over the last few years, we moved away from that to manage RDS. Now, you could have asked, why didn't we do RDS before? Um, one thing I didn't say before was for many years, we were not a venture back company. We did raise a, a significant venture round after we were profitable. We raised a half a billion dollars from the SoftBank Vision Fund in 2018 uh, or 2019. But before that, uh, we were running in a profitable way, running off of revenue. And when you're in that mindset, you're also quite cost conscious. And we had decided we could do a better job. As we scale, we find that the managed service is a very good idea. And I got to say, one of the things, this is a technical point, but I want to make it here because many of you are quite technical. Um, we've, we use DynamoDB and RDS Aurora. DynamoDB, as you know, is a key value store. And our drives data is very amenable to key value processing. And we've been very pleased with its scalability and the ability to really support massive numbers of users very quickly in a very predictable performance way. We also need querying capabilities, so we do store it in Aurora. And, and, and we use the Postgres front end uh, that Aurora has. Uh, 
One of the things we've been very pleased about is for us, predictable performance is probably even more important than just low latency or high performance or high throughput. And one of the things we've been very pleased with Aurora, with Aurora is that it actually allows us to pin a query plan. It doesn't change the query plan underneath us while the work's happening. And that's something that many databases do in an adaptive way. They think they know best. Well, they do know best except when they don't. And one of the things that Aurora we like is the ability to pin down a query plan because we care about predictability. And so that's that's one of the things that we've been pretty pleased about. And I want to talk a little bit about what the processing itself entails. And this processing is actually done in a sort of serverless way. Now, we don't use Lambda for a variety of reasons. We sort of have built our own serverless infrastructure, um, being able to spin large amounts of instances and CPU instances uh, kind of on the fly. Um, and we do that to meet certain types of SLAs that we have. Uh, and the nature of our SLAs are statistical. Uh, for example, we, we may be asked to, or we may be required to process 99% of the trips that are under one hour within five minutes, as an example, or 95% of the trips that are under a certain amount of time within a certain amount of time. And then for long trips, that might be people driving for eight hours or 10 hours at a time. Sometimes people do do that. Uh, of course, there's massive amounts of competition. We, have some, we may have some other SLAs for that. Now, at one extreme, we could just spin up an infinite number or virtually infinite number of CPUs, like one per driver. Of course, that's going to be tremendously wasteful. So the name of the game for us is to figure out how to run our CPUs, how to scale up and down our CPUs. And we've been really happy that AWS doesn't just foist an instance control algorithm on us or a load control algorithm on us, that it allows us to implement our own and provide the mechanisms so we just focus on the policy and the algorithms. And one of the natures of our work is we're actually able to both use observations of our queue latencies and queue buildup and our rate of processing, which depends a lot on the algorithms that we apply and use, and build our own controllers for doing this. I want to show you uh, an example from one of our systems as to how it works. And our goal is to kind of keep our latencies roughly predictable. But remember, the actual SLAs are statistical. So every once in a while, it's OK to violate a latency uh, demand. So what this animation here shows is a graph of data from a real system. The y-axis is the number of trips. Uh, it sort of shows the scale of the number of trips. And the x-axis is days. Uh, so it's over a one-week period uh, in 2019. And actually, the one of the days here is Memorial Day, May 28th. And what the blue line on top is showing is the trips. So trips come in. And what the green line is showing is the amount, the number of minutes of latency experienced by that trip before the outputs are delivered to our partner systems and to our users. And the idea here is to keep the green line somewhat flat. We're not obsessed with flat. What we're obsessed with is not violating our statistical SLA. You can see as the load comes and goes, uh, we're able to cope with it just fine. And typically what happens is that the workload starts on Sunday, there's a certain amount, then Monday it goes up, Tuesday more, Wednesday even more, and then peaks on Friday, and then Saturday it comes down, Sunday it comes down, sometimes Sunday is higher than Saturday, depending on the weekend, and then Monday it goes steadily back up through Friday. And this particular week, Memorial Day hit, so there was a little bit less driving. But you can see how the green line is pegged. Now, how's that happening? This thing shows on the top, it shows the same picture from the previous slide. On the bottom, the orange line overlays the number of CPU instances that we've created. And I have um, obfuscated the number of CPUs on the right. Uh, suffice it to say that it's, it runs in, uh, in a very large number. Um, and you can see that it tracks the load. And it's our control algorithms that allow us to do this. And we are able to do this by observing the SLAs that we want to meet and the type of performance that we want to provide. I mean, most of the delay is queuing delay, and that's a good thing. But the queuing delay shouldn't grow unbounded and shouldn't allow us to violate our SLAs, and we want to be able to provide that performance back. Now I want to talk a little bit about how we process our telematics data um, in the historical context, what the warehousing story looks like. And this is needed for a variety of reasons, one of which is in order to make the core telematics processing on the um, effective and performant with our SLAs, the hot data needs to be contained. You can't let it grow and grow and grow. And so we periodically, um, not periodically, we continuously are moving data to our data warehouse when we determine that it's no, you know, that the data is no longer um, hot. We remove it from the hot store. 
We use a variety of Amazon tools, uh, and we've evolved this over time um, to implement our analytics. And there's something really interesting about the way in which our machine learning and analytics works. There's things that run over modest amounts of data but are extremely computationally intensive. And then there are things that run over massive amounts of data that are really more traditional TPC-8 style warehousing type queries or maybe a little bit statistical in nature. And then there are things that are massive amounts of data that we need to train our models and it's massively interesting or difficult computation. So we have all, all kinds, you know, including neural network models. And the biggest point I would make in terms of the facilities that we're able to leverage off of AWS is we can get all sorts of combinations of these things. And one of the things we benefit greatly from is a trend that we've seen observed on AWS that we would like to very much encourage, which is the separation of compute and storage. Back in the day, it used to be that you would get, for example, Redshift, and you would get a certain storage associated with it, and a certain type of computation associated with it, and they were very tightly coupled. So if you had a massive amount of computation to do with a massive amount of data, you were sort of tied into essentially also kind of getting something that bundled the two together. But now with things like Spectrum, you have the ability to separate it. And one of the ways we leverage this is that we use the Redshift Spectrum. We get this data coming in, we take massive amounts of sensor data. The first thing we do is we take all the high frequency sensory data and we run it through uh, Kinesis and Firehose and produce parquet files and push them into S3. And we remove out any personally identifiable or significant personal identifiable information. And we localize the PII information in Aurora in the hot data set. And we typically don't need that information beyond the transactional time, beyond the neural time. So the warehouses actually don't need to maintain that information. That's by design. Our partner systems maintain it outside of us, so we can be more privacy focused. But in addition, we now are able to take Redshift and run over that uh, the, the Redshift spec spectrum and run over this S3 data. But we also run a bunch of processing over um, uh, using Redshift over whatever its traditional data stores. Uh, we use Athena for certain types of modeling as well. But there are other things here that we don't uh, that I don't mention that we're also using. But this theme of separating compute and storage is something that we do like very much. And one example of this that we're uh, doing now is um, using, I think it's called ElasticFS, which is like a network file system that AWS provides. Um, so we're able to now run what looks like essentially file system-based computation. And there are things that we're doing now that benefit from that, that previously we were using S3 APIs for. Of course, S3 is more restrictive APIs, and it is, it's really something which doesn't allow for updates to happen readily. You have to write the whole blob back. Um, whereas with ElasticFS, we can run certain other types of computation uh, more effectively. So we really, while I don't want to claim we're at the forefront of trying these things out, um, uh, we actually are not but we are leveraging them. And some of the mindset we have are often we try to do things from first principles and have often built a number of tools of our own, including for machine learning. Um, but when it makes sense, we're pretty eager to use whatever is available. Now, in the last few minutes, I want to talk about having talked to you about all of the sensor processing, the types of data, the types of computation, what they're used for, and how we leverage infrastructure, AWS infrastructure, I now want to talk about our privacy posture, how we achieve privacy by design. First and foremost, it stems from our business model. Our business model actually puts privacy first. In other words, we view privacy not as a problem to be overcome, but as an opportunity to provide better services to our partners and to our users. We, unlike some other participants or some other players in the telematics space who monetize the data by, you know, with marketing or advertising or sharing or selling the data to third parties, uh, we just don't do it. Uh, we obtain subscription fees from our business partners and our user policies are simple, transparent, no data will ever be shared or sold without your permission. And we don't ask for any permissions that we don't need. So first, it's business model is puts privacy as a business tool, as a positive business weapon. Second, simple and transparent policies. Third, we work with a number of consumer groups, the Consumer Federation of America. We've had, we have a number of discussions with them and engaged them. The ACLU, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and various other consumer groups. 
And fourth, we have an external privacy board uh, with some really eminent experts in the field of um, privacy and policy and technology that I'll talk about. So we have a number of privacy compliances, um, GDPR, CCPA, and we also have the ISO 27001 certification, one of the, probably the first company in our space and one of the first technology companies to have obtained that certification as well. And it stems not just from checkbox items, but fundamentally something that we believe in, uh, as I mentioned before, um, and aligning our business to focus on privacy as opposed to viewing it as, hey, it's a problem we overcome, or we got to put a 20-page EULA and get people to sign off on it. Um, in terms of other types of security and certifications, there's a bunch here that I'm sure the experts will recognize, and we have all of these certifications that we've obtained. But I want to explain to you what that means underneath the hood. I talked about those four themes there with respect to the business, with respect to uh, simple and transparent um, uh, EULAs, and then the engagement with consumer groups and our privacy board. And through those engagements, uh, both prior to and through those engagements, we have the following practices. Um, the business model is simple, no data shared or sold. Second, minimum amount of data to provide the services. And in fact, the PII that's collected is now stored in ways that really are away and divorced from where the rest of the data is in bulk that we need to do for various types of analytics. Third, end-to-end -end encryption at rest. It's something that actually AWS makes really easy to achieve. Uh, simply ULAs that I mentioned, something where you don't need to be an attorney with a law degree from a top university at law school to understand. That's something we believe in. Uh, data retention policies, and frankly, user consent. We get users can ask to turn things off pretty easily and ask for deletion to happen pretty easily as well. In terms of data residency, this is something we leverage AWS's global footprint. We're in nine zones. Um, data is stored and processed in the region in which it's collected, and that's typically by default. Um, for example, Canadian data remains in Canada, American data in the US, EU data in the EU, uh, and so on and so forth. And there are technical controls into our data warehouse. Retention policies that automatically delete data when it's no longer needed. Um, access limited with role-based access control um, that's quite granular and increasingly more and more granular on a need to know and various mechanisms for discovery and classification of data. Um, analysis of data that's happening in automated and semi-automated and human triggered ways to ensure data compli uh, compliance with policy. Um, and ultimately, all data, of course, is encrypted at rest. That's table stakes right now, but it's still something that needs to really be done. And we do this across all of our data sets. And again, being putting everything on AWS allows us to make that more achievable. In fact, we have no production servers on premises at all. I talked about the privacy board. Um, we have a pretty eminent privacy board, an external privacy board. Uh, the board chair is uh, Dr. Daniel Weitzner. He is uh, a, a professor at MIT, uh, a researcher at MIT who heads up the Internet Policy Research Initiative, and he was in the Obama White House. Um, I have personally known him for many years and uh, have really a, a great deal of respect uh, and admiration for the work he does at the intersection of technology and law and policy. And someone who's helped us create this this, this board. Uh, Professor Oren Kurz, uh, probably the nation's foremost, or one of the foremost experts in Fourth Amendment law and privacy. Uh, he has uh, been a great resource for us. Kathleen O'Toole uh, is another uh, well-known person. She was a police commissioner in Boston and Seattle. Um, now is involved with a, a number of tech companies and has, again, been an extremely thoughtful um, um, resource and person for us to engage with as we craft and implement um, our privacy policies. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Van Eek. Uh, he is uh, in Belgium, another expert with a more European and international perspective as a global company. We aspire not only to understand and uphold privacy mores and customs of the United States, but pretty much every country in which we operate. And it's important to understand that privacy is not a purely technical problem. It is not a purely legal problem. It is a social and personal issue and uh, understanding that across different cultures, across different legislation uh, jurisdictions is something that's very, very important to us. So with that, uh, I would like to thank all of you for your attention. 
um, and and I hope that you have both learned what we do, understand how and what we do and why it matters. And ultimately, I want to leave you on a positive note that although I showed you pictures of how dire the situation seems to be, um, it's important to note that we are at the starting point of this journey. There are 1.4 billion vehicles on the road and we serve several million vehicles on a daily basis. We're a fast growing company, growing exponentially, but we're at the beginning stages of our journey. And the problem is becoming worse, as I showed you. But the mechanisms that we're providing, when we scale them out even further and start to get to more and more of those 1.4 billion vehicles and billions of drivers, we can start to see results like I've shown here. 39% reduction in distracted driving, 30% reduction in natural speeding, and that will allow us to achieve a world where driving becomes safer. Now, 10 years ago, we had 1 billion vehicles on the road. So over the past decade, we've seen a 40% increase. So there's clearly a lot more vehicles happening. And many of those vehicles are coming in parts of the world, not the United States or Western Europe, but in other parts of the world, Southeast Asia, um, China, India, Africa, Latin America. And so it's really important for these technologies to be cost effective. And that's where mobile fits in. But it's also important to understand that vehicular technology is advancing at a pretty rapid clip. So today we're in a human driving world and we're starting to see assistive driving capabilities and, or ADAS capabilities and we're on a road to autonomy. So you might ask what happens when the world becomes more and more autonomous? I believe very strongly that the type of work we're doing over at CMT is going to be the future of how we assess safety and risk in a more autonomous world or in a world where there's hybrid human driving and autonomous driving. Because in that world, to assess the safety of an autonomous or mostly autonomous or a semi-autonomous vehicle requires technology to understand how good are the sensors that the vehicle has and what is the vehicle perceiving about the world? How good are the reinforcement learning and machine learning and AI algorithms that are being used in the vehicle? And how good is the software? And if we think for a moment that once we get autonomy, crashes will go away, you will, be, you will then have to believe, if you believe that, then you also believe that sensors never make mistakes, software is infallible, and AI is infallible. None of that is true. So it's really important to have lightweight observable technologies as we head into this world of autonomy so we're able to independently assess and also assess what the vehicles are themselves seeing in order to make judgments as to how the vehicle is performing and functioning in C2, in the real world, under real condition. And that's really where we see the journey ahead for these technologies, for telematics, as we spend this decade with the highest rate of change, a pace of change of automotive and vehicular technologies, CMT aspires to be the partner for companies wanting to make the world's roads and drivers safer. And we're thrilled to partner that AWS is our partner in this endeavor. Thank you.